Rising higher than mainstream thinking. Are you annoyed by affirmations? When someone comes up to you and says, Think positively! Do you politely request that they refer to verse 12 of chapter 3 of the book of the overwhelmed brain, where we read the gospel of Paul who states that all who enter into the realm of positive thought must also exit with the belief that all thinking such that is positive will be subject to truth which shall set those who fall upon it and bequeath thy name in the presence of truth in which lie the thoughts of positive and I ah, forget it thanks for the advice but uh, I gotta go uh, I left the iron on if affirmations feel like lies and positive thinking feels like denial then start the journey of incredible learning and growth so that you can create the life you've always wanted now Hello, this is Paul Coliani, host of The Overwhelmed Brain, the personal growth show for the critical thinker. On this show, I'll share practical, down-to-earth steps to help you improve your mood and keep you sane in this powerful journey we call life. We'll talk about why we do the things we do and what we can do to reach higher levels of happiness and lower levels of stress and overwhelm. My goal is to help you become empowered so that you can create the life you want. Today's quick quote is by Walt Disney, and it's this. Of all of our inventions for mass communications, pictures still speak the most universally understood language. Today's episode has a lot to do with the language we speak. How you word the things you say and ask yourself will dictate the answer you get and may also be exactly what you need to hear to change your life completely. And before we begin all of this fun, this show is provided as a public service of the Healing Broadcast Network. If you or your employer would like to sponsor The Overwhelmed Brain, simply send an email to sponsor at theoverwhelmedbrain.com and we'll send you the details. Speaking of which, if you've been listening to the show a while, you may have heard me say that I play guitar. Well, If you've ever had an interest in playing guitar yourself, I want to tell you about levelsforguitar.com. It's not the usual website for guitar lessons as it uses a really simple but time-tested approach to guitar and music to teach you how to be an amazing musician, not just another guitar player. Now, the reason I'm telling you this is because they told me they wanted to offer the listeners of this show a one-month free trial. That's incredible because you can learn a lot in a month. So get your free month of lessons at levelsforguitar.com forward slash brain. I know you're going to enjoy it. So what's today's episode about? Well, a single sentence can change your entire life. A single sentence changed mine. I don't know how life would have turned out better or worse if I hadn't heard it, but One thing my stepfather said to me as a child stuck in my head my entire life. For some reason, I always wanted to be around mature people. Hanging around adults just felt better to me. I wanted to be accepted by the adults and interact with them. Some would talk to me and some wouldn't. But I was getting a little frustrated because I couldn't figure out why some adults didn't want to talk to me. (laughs) It wasn't because I was only 10 years old, was it? Nah, I couldn't be. (laughs) Well, I'm sure it had something to do with it for sure. I expressed my frustration with my stepfather and he told me something that burned into my brain the moment he said it. He said, if you want to be treated like a man, you need to act like one. Now, for some reason, what, what he said and the way he said it made an impact. And at that moment, I changed. I went from playing like a careless child and acting all goofy to listening to how adults talk to each other. I would pay attention to their responses after I would say something to them. Did they react favorably or not? Did they seem happy to talk with me or were they just getting the conversation over with so that they could go on to better things? I didn't know what I was doing then, but 
when I think back on it now, I realize that I became an observer of human behavior. I did change. My entire life changed, in fact, because I was able to communicate with people much older than me, which gave me a little advantage when I wanted to get away with things. I wasn't always in trouble, but because I observed how people reacted to my words and behavior, I could almost predict their behavior in most circumstances. At the same time, this was a gift. It turned out to also be a curse. Now, curse is a strong word, but because I got so good at adjusting my behavior to fit someone else's personality, I was liked by everyone and everyone trusted me. Even in elementary school, kids would confide in me and tell me secrets. But how is that a curse? Well, that part wasn't the curse. It was nice to be trusted and confided in. However, the curse was that I became a chameleon. I learned how to adjust my behavior so well that I never developed individuality. I didn't develop a distinct personality that people could read. I was everyone's friend and knew how to communicate with almost everyone. But I was lonely inside. I was everyone's friend and no one was really mine. I would know almost everything about other people and they would know very little about me. I'd share stuff, but only stuff I believed they wanted to hear. I had incredible powers of observation and no personality that I could truly call my own. And I took this, quote, personality into my relationships uh, up until at least 38 years old. I made, quote, best friends that I couldn't stand to talk to because I really didn't enjoy being with them. And they didn't know who I was because I wasn't showing them. So I would burn out my friendships. There have only been a few people, if that, outside of my intimate relationships that have gotten to know more of the real me than anyone else. My true self never showed up because I believed that the only way to communicate with others was to be the person I believed they wanted me to be. Do you know what happens when you're the person others want you to be? Here's what happens. People trust you more. People fall in love with you quicker. People ask you to do more things for them because you're always saying yes to their requests. People take up more of your time and energy and even money. And finally, especially, you get totally burnt out because you can't stand being around them anymore. All of these, quote, benefits of being a chameleon, adapting to the person you're with, are really just symptoms of a deeper, darker issue. When you are not yourself around people and you behave the way you believe they want you to behave, you will carry the heavy burden of faking it until you collapse. And the longer you fake your smile and your laughter and your friendship, the more you feel rolled over and taken advantage of. And the people you're with won't even know they're doing it to you. I mean, how could they? If you transform into the person you believe they want you to be, they'll never know you're doing it because nothing will ever seem wrong or unusual to them. And if you do this, do you even know you're doing it? <laughs> and especially, do you know why? My why was the one thing my stepfather told me when I was 10 or 11. If you want to be treated like a man, you have to act like one. The benefits from my change from hearing that sentence were phenomenal. I became an acute observer of human behavior and communication. But that skill came with a price. For the next 28 years, no one would know the real me. What's worse than that is that I didn't know the real me. I had what I thought was my identity, but I couldn't figure out why I wasn't happy. Do you know the real you? What's something that someone said to you when you were younger that changed your entire life? And was that change for the better? Did it have its advantages at the time? Did you learn and grow and evolve from it? Or did it set you back in some way or many ways? I was about 38 when I realized 
I wasn't being who I really wanted to be. I had no personal boundaries because I was too busy pleasing everyone around me. I would get sad for no reason and then angry out of the blue and I just felt like there was something wrong with me. There was something wrong with me. I didn't know who I was because I never stood up for myself and I never let people judge me. That's right. I highly recommend allowing people to judge you. Not because it feels good to be judged, but to make sure that they are seeing the real you. When you know you're going to get judged no matter what you do, you might as well come out of your shell and be exactly who you are. Then they can say things to you like, wow, you're awful and stupid. And you can give them a big smile and say, wow, thank you so much. (laughs) The fact that you said that means that my authentic self affected you in some way that is hard for you to understand. I totally get it and I appreciate you being honest with me. (laughs) They'll be like, huh? What are you talking about? You're even stupider than I thought. And again, you say, thank you for saying that. I respect that you're giving me your honest opinion. I don't want anything less than that from you. And then they'll walk away shaking their head in disgust and disbelief because they believe that you really are everything they think. But you know the truth. When you are being your true self, you will realize many things and come to embrace those things like you don't know everything and you won't be attractive to everyone and not everyone will see you as kind or compassionate and not everyone will see everything you know you are. And the reason this is all good is because when you are being who you really are, you realize that there are many people who aren't comfortable with that. They'd rather you fake it so that they don't have to be their authentic selves either. Many people don't show their authentic self. Many people don't come from a place of true authenticity. They're afraid of what others will think and how they'll be judged. But being judged, even though it doesn't feel good, is a strong indication that you're being yourself because more people judge those who live from their authenticity than those who wear a mask. Think about how unempowering it feels to wear a mask. I did that for about 30 years and even though I didn't know I was doing it, I do remember that empty, missing something feeling inside. Did you ever have that feeling? Saying things to yourself like, something's missing. I don't know what it is, but something is missing in my life. What is it? Let's start filling what might be missing in your life next. What's missing in your life? That's probably something you've said to yourself at least once. But the way you word that question can make a huge difference in helping you discover what is actually missing in your life. We're so used to asking questions in a way that makes sense. And as long as the question makes sense, we'll come up with the same answers we always come up with. It's like asking, what's two plus two? You always know the answer, but some people will tell you, well, that's not always the case. And then you'll think they're crazy. It's simple math, of course. The answer is four. But you already know where I'm going with this, don't you? Two plus two doesn't always equal four. Because the first thing you have to do is define two. Two of what plus two of what is how you start to think differently. So when you come up with a question like, What's missing in my life? Think about how you can word that differently so that you can come up with different answers. Does that make sense? For example, let's go through an exercise. I'm going to ask you a question and you just think or say out loud the answer. Are you ready? What is missing from your life? Just think of one thing that you believe is missing from your life. Got it? Now, come back and listen to how I word the next question. It's going to be slightly different, and it's going to take your brain in an alternate direction. 
It may make you feel different and you will probably actually think differently about the question, even though it's similar to the first one. Here it is. What exists in your life that prevents you from having what's missing in your life? This question, the way it's worded, forces you to come at the problem from the outside in instead of the inside where you are now out. It's sort of like being locked in a building. You want to get out, but no matter how many times you try to open the doors, they won't budge. You try every day in a different way, but you always come up with the same result. You can't get out of the locked building. But what if you were outside the building trying to get in? That's what I like to do with some of the problems in my life. That's how I think and reword questions so that I can come up with different answers. What exists in your life that prevents you from having what's missing in your life? (laughs) That's an out-of-the-box way to think. Now, I realize I added an element to the question that wasn't there before, and that is that something is actually preventing you from having what's missing in your life. But if you think about it, when you don't have what you want, something must be preventing it, right? And really, when you want or need something, What should you focus on? Should you focus on the thing you need or what can help you get the thing you need? If I want to open a locked door, should I focus on just the door or perhaps the means to open or unlock the door? Those means are your inner resources. And resources are the thoughts and ideas that you may or may not know you have, but usually lead to the solution to your problem. Here's another rewording of the same question. What's missing from the way you're trying to fulfill what's missing from your life? (laughs) I'll say it again. What's missing from the way you're trying to fulfill what's missing from your life? This one's trickier, but if you pay really close attention, you can tell I redirected your focus from the thing that's missing to the process of getting the thing that's missing. You see what I'm doing? When you shift your focus to the process instead of the end result, you shift your thinking. The end result is what you want. For example, if you said, what's missing from my life is more money, then by focusing on not having enough money, you're really just focusing on how you feel about not having enough money. You can address the feeling, for sure. I'm all about that. And you can certainly just let go of attachments and you won't even worry about what's missing. (laughs) I'm all about that too. But sometimes those processes can take years to get through because there are so many layers. I prefer to just go toward the most resourceful path, the direction that will create the change you want. The challenge with the question, what's missing from my life? is that you don't know what's missing. You only know something is missing. If you think there's something missing in your life, then there is. I won't sugarcoat it. What's missing is what's missing. But the question is, how do you find out what that is? Again, change the wording and the focus of the question. The question, what's missing from my life, leads you to focus on an end result. But since you don't know what's missing, then you're focusing on nothing, right? I mean, if you don't know what's missing and you ask, well, what's missing? You'll always come up with, I don't know. But if you change the words so that you're focusing on something else other than what's missing, you get a different response. When you word the question like this, you will think differently. Here's the question. What do I need to do to help me attain what's missing in my life. Or you can be even more creative and ask, if I had what's been missing in my life, how would I feel? And what would my life look like? Think about that for a minute. Pause this show if you have to, because what this question does is take you to a place of already having what's been missing in your life and working backwards from there. If you had what's been missing in your life, 
how would you feel and what would your life look like? Even if you don't know what's missing, you can still come up with an answer. And to further drill this home, you can answer this question. If someone took my place in this life, this is what I'd tell them that they need to do in order to feel satisfied and fulfilled. The power behind this question is that it really digs into your subconscious mind and finds the answers you already have. And that's the trick to all of this too. You have the answers inside of you, but because you've been asking the same questions the same way for such a long time, you can't access those answers. The simple question, uh, what color is the sky, only needs to dig so deep into your brain for an answer. Why, that's an easy one. (laughs) But change it only slightly and you're forced to use more resources inside your mind. What makes the sky that color? Or what needs to happen to change the color of the sky? Now, unless you're a meteorologist or just know this kind of trivia, the rest of us have to think about questions like this. Change the questions you ask yourself to shift the focus. How do you do that? Well, it does take practice. After all, how do you learn to change a question if you never practice doing that? I'll tell you how in this last segment. Changing the questions you ask yourself is vital to changing your life. This is why the worksheets I create are so effective. They ask you things in a way that you're not used to. We get used to the way our language works, and our thinking is typically confined to the language we use. It's a pretty interesting thought, isn't it? In other words, the words you use to communicate are also the boundaries that are created for your thought processes. If you know 20 to 30,000 words and have figured out the easiest and most concise way of putting those words together to communicate your ideas, then that is the extent of your normal thought processes. When you have to think a little harder and access more ways to arrange words into different and more creative sentences, then you start communicating a different message. After all, The sentence, I drove the car, is a lot different than, I car the drove. (laughs) But even though the latter sentence sounds awkward, notice what happens in your mind if you try to translate it. Your brain goes into a different place for translation. The same words in a different order cause you to think in a way that changes the way you process information. The problem a lot of us have or have had is that we've asked ourselves the same questions the same way over and over again. This creates an infinite loop of despair because we never come to a solution. The question, how can I make more money, is a question I've asked myself over and over again throughout the years. But when I changed what to focus on, I made different decisions. I would try to make more money by doing what I believed would make more money, but It never worked, so I decided to take my focus off the money. Since what I was asking wasn't leading to a solution, I changed the question. I asked, who do I need to be to be the person who can make as much money as I deserve? This question doesn't assume I don't have enough money. It just assumes that something needs to change in me. What's interesting about rewording the questions to yourself is that you discover something else that may be preventing you from getting the things you want in life, or even better, revealing what's missing in your life. My question, who do I need to be to be the person who can make as much money as I deserve, forces me to shift my perspective. It's no longer about the money. It's about the things I can do and the thoughts that I can have that lead me to my ultimate goal. Does that make sense? In fact, that question assumes I deserve money. But what if when I ask it, I get this bad feeling inside of me and the words, 
I don't deserve money come to mind. Imagine if that was in me the whole time. That would reveal a whole lot about why I'm not making the amount of money I deserve. After all, if I feel I don't deserve money deep down inside, I'm going to make decisions based on that deep belief. That's why finding out your values is so important. The values worksheet that I created is designed to figure out what's most important to you so that your decisions and behaviors are in alignment with those deeper subconscious beliefs you're carrying around. And when you're aligned with your deepest beliefs about what's important to you, everything in your life lines up. Now, if your deepest, most important aspect regarding money has to do with scarcity, it would certainly lead you into fear and scarcity over and over again. For example, in the worksheet I ask, what's important to you about X? And you know, X being the topic you want to address. So I'd say, what's important to you about money? And you'd list a bunch of things that are important to you about money. For example, I want lots of it. It has to come easy. I don't want to be in debt, etc., etc. It's not exactly how the exercise goes, but it's close enough. Once you list everything that's important to you about a major area in your life, and then you put them in the order of most important to least, you'll discover what's driving all of your decisions and behaviors. That's why when you reword the questions you ask yourself, you access the deeper recesses of your mind, causing you to uncover some very revealing and life-changing truths. When I changed how I worded my questions about money in my life, I changed my direction. I realized that it wasn't money that was hard to get. It was my fear of being good enough to deserve the money. If my decisions are motivated by that belief, I'll never make the money I deserve. So I worked on that and I changed my outcome. This works for anything you ask yourself, especially on a consistent basis. What's missing in my life? <laughs> That's a big question. How many answers can you come up with? Probably quite a few. But where would you search for what's missing if you knew what was missing? That's a completely different way to look at the problem you're having. So what I want to share is one of the ways to figure out how to reword the self-talk and self-questioning going on in our minds. One thing is to use the five W's and one H. You know what those are, right? Who, what, when, where, why, and how. These change the direction of a question. The direction is what you focus on. When you change the wording of your question, focus on the process of getting what you want, not the subject of what you want. For example, focusing on all the ways of unlocking a door is a lot different than focusing on the door itself. Just focusing on the problem, a locked door for instance, only keeps the problem stagnant and unchanging. This is where your negative feelings lie as well. So you end up focusing on how bad things are instead of how you want to feel. Take the focus off the problem and move it towards the process of getting your outcome. Another example of that is the statement, I just want to be happy. The focus is, I'm not happy. How can I get happy? Using the five W's and one H, you can find different ways to reword the question. Who do I need to be in order to find happiness? What can I do differently than I'm doing now? When will I change what I do in order to get happiness into my life? Where do I need to be in order to find happiness? Why am I unhappy now? How do I know I'm unhappy? The trick to coming up with different questions is by adding the five W's and one H in creative ways. You may not be that great at this at first, but you'll get better. Just start the sentence with one of them and create it as you go. So if you always ask yourself, what's missing in my life? Start playing with the words using a different W or H word. Try using when. Let me think of one. Instead of what's missing in my life, you could say, was there a time when something wasn't missing in my life? 
What was happening at that time? Here's another when. When do I know something's missing? And when does it feel like it's not? These are brain twisters, aren't they? (laughs) Just play with the W's and 1H so that you're wording what you always say to yourself differently. That way you travel a different direction for the solution. Another way to start thinking differently is to change the words around in those same questions. And just like I car the drove changes how you have to process the question, it can work with almost anything. What's missing in my life can change to what's life that's missing? Or missing life is what's that? (laughs) I realize they sound weird, but you have to make things sound a little weird to get out of the pattern you've created with the repetition of the same questions over and over again. The question, how can I get a raise at work when repeated enough times will decrease in effectiveness over time. But switching the words around might have a different effect. How can work get a raise out of me? (laughs) Or back to using the W's and H and swapping words around at the same time, how is getting a raise going to help me? Or, here's a good one, what will a raise do for my work? (laughs) These are all strange questions, but that's good. Some make sense and some don't. But the process of trying to make sense of them is what causes you to come up with different ideas and different solutions. And another thing it does is help you break from the pattern of feeling bad when you ask the question. If you feel bad every time you ask yourself, What's missing from my life? Then you definitely need to change the question. Like, if I had everything I needed, how would other people describe what my life looks like? What do you think of that reframe? (laughs) Kind of wild how it not only takes you outside the problem looking in, but now you're looking at your life from the perspective of someone else. Language can be static and unchanging, causing you to repeat bad feelings over and over again, or it can be dynamic and surprising. This is similar to how I coach people. I like to surprise them with questions they absolutely wouldn't ask themselves. For example, one of my favorite approaches is removing the assumption that something is bad. So when someone tells me, I just lost my job, I might ask, really? Is that a bad thing? They'll say, well, of course it is. I need to work to make money. Then I would say, okay, but why is it bad to not have a job? Or more specifically, why is it bad to not have money? I get the strangest looks, but for the first time, they have to dig deeper to explore their beliefs about the problem. We usually assume something is bad because We're programmed throughout life to know what's good and bad. But when we aren't relying on our old programming and we're forced to figure out if we really believe what we believe, we access parts of our brain that reveal a lot more hidden truths. I believed for the longest time that without a relationship, I couldn't be happy. Well, coming from a home where my mom wouldn't leave her husband, my stepfather, no matter how bad he treated her, probably instilled the belief that I can only be happy in a relationship, even if it's an unhealthy one. When I finally understood that I was simply going with what I observed others doing, not having tried being alone and exploring that for a while, I discovered a lot about myself. Your beliefs are many times made up by other people, not true personal experience. So keep this in mind as you go through the years. You'll see this time and time again with people who complain about politics, for example. They'll put down the people they see on TV only by what they heard a reporter talk about. But they won't do their own research to find what's biased and what's truth. The same goes for anything you heard about someone else. Do you listen to other people's opinion about them or do you find out on your own by asking them directly? What truths do you have lying dormant inside of you that might help you find what you want in life? What is missing that might be down there that could change everything? 
surprise your mind by changing how you think. And you change how you think by altering the language you use. Change the words. Mix them up. Add the five W's and the one H and just know that the repetition of the same questions over and over again will cause you to never reveal what's missing from your life. Maybe nothing's missing. Maybe it's always been there, but you've been afraid to grab it. Sometimes figuring out what's missing is a matter of figuring out the one question you haven't asked yourself yet. Which brings my closing question. What is the one thing that you haven't asked yourself that when you reveal the answer will change your life in a way that is meaningful? Remember, these questions don't have to make sense. They just have to make an impact in your brain. When you change the way your brain normally works, you start changing your results. The process of thought can be stagnant and unchanging, or it can be dynamic with twists and turns to help you figure out solutions to life's most challenging questions. And with that, where can you go to have a great day? (laughs) Oh, that might be the actual closing question. Oh, well, remember, where can mean a lot of things. It can mean getting in your car or getting in your mind. It can mean going into another room in your house or another feeling in your body. Interpretation is the most wonderful aspect of all of this because how you interpret is where you end up. Change your life by changing your focus and altering the way you ask yourself questions. It's just one of the ways to figure out what's missing in your life. We'll soon again talk. Thank you for listening to another episode of The Overwhelmed Brain. I thank Maureen, Amy, Anne Marie, uh, Sean, Leith, Lori, Joe, Amy, Kate, Lisa, Kathy, Ann, Anthony, Richard, Nancy, Graham, Rhoda, and Rhonda, Bertan, Burton, Bertan, and John for subscribing to the newsletter. And I thank Jeffrey for commenting on why he unsubscribed from the newsletter. Hey, I appreciate all the feedback when you unsubscribe for any reason. Thank you, Jeffrey. And for commenting on the blog, Larry, Alexis, and Dan for connecting with me through Facebook. Gabrielle, Jeff, Peggy, Eliza, or Eliza, I'm not sure, Sandy and Greg, and Lyanne, I think, and Jeff, and Jamie, and for their reviews of uh, How to Deal with Irrational People, the book I created a couple months ago, Herbie and Chris, thank you for your reviews in Amazon, and for connecting with me through LinkedIn, Taniqua, and for their direct messages, Farouk, S.A.J., Denise, Bill, Brandon, Sandy, Peggy, and Chris. Oh, wait, and Gina and Carl and Thomas, those two. <laughs> and uh, for connecting me through Goodreads, Matthew. And for subscribing to the YouTube channel, Wheat Bix Girl. And an Uber thank you to Lizzie and Alexis and Kimberly. I think I didn't mention you last week, Kimberly, for their generous donations to the show. Thank you guys so much. You are helping keep the show going. Speaking of keeping the show anything, keep up with the show by heading over to theoverwhelmedbrain.com and sign up for your weekly personal growth message. Feel free to reach out to me anytime through the contact link on that site as well. I also want to thank the listeners who are using the Amazon link on the site to support the show. Your support is helping, and if you aren't using the link to shop at Amazon, why not? You can help with the operating cost of this show just by doing what you're probably already doing, shopping at Amazon. Go to theoverwhelmedbrain.com and click on the Amazon button and find what you're looking for now. Your shopping habits mean a lot to me and they're going towards a good cause. You. And just a quick note, I want to thank the sponsors of this show. Whenever you hear me sound a little bit like a commercial, it's because I support sponsors as much as they support the show. There's nothing I want more than to keep this show on the air and free to listen to. So support the sponsors you hear about because they're a big part of what we do here. And if I didn't call your name in this episode, just know that I appreciate you and thank you for being there for me, listening, learning, 
and growing. So what a question. What's missing from my life? When you say things like, I feel like there's something missing, like I am meant for more, you keep yourself so distanced from taking steps to change your life that you're lucky if anything ever changes. What I mean by that is a question like, what's missing, is broad and hard to answer because there are so many answers. But changing it to, what is something that I could do right now to fulfill my life just a little bit? That's an entirely different approach. One approach keeps you in the clouds and the other grounds you. This is how I approach everything I need to accomplish in my life and why I don't do (laughs) woo-woo. One of the things that movies like The Secret has done to us is allow us to be less proactive and more positive. Then when you're finally bankrupt, (laughs) like what happened to me, you look back and go, oh, I was supposed to take action too? I thought my thoughts equaled things. It turns out that positive thoughts are fantastic motivators for inaction. When you're thinking positively, there's no reason to go after what you want because you're already fine with what you got. But what gets people is that they're really not fine with what they have. So thinking positively just adds a false layer of belief that hides a want or a need that never gets fulfilled. Sugarcoating is denial, and denial creates false hope and beliefs that keep what's missing in your life missing. So, here's a strangely worded question for you. Are you ready for this? What's really missing in your life that if you had it right now, that tomorrow you'd be able to move forward with what used to be missing, now fulfilled, Can you go into the future with what was once missing and now completely a part of you so much so that it fulfills you so that you can feel empowered now as you walk into a future knowing you will have all the resources you need? I'll let you wrap your brain around that one. (laughs) And what may happen is that you find yourself stepping into your power so that you can be firm in your decisions and actions and as a result create the life you want when you do this you'll discover what i already know to be true about you that you are amazing (laughs) 